Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're going to sing a little bit. Stay seated if you'd like. Sing along, stand up, sing along, don't sing, keep talking, whatever you'd like to do. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy to all my fears are gone. I'm no longer resolve it <laughs> just, just a little game we play it's a <laughs> right there the second time around oh my gosh waiting on another verse there hi folks good morning how's everybody i'm looking over here no one here here we go here we go hi and hi everybody watching online listening on uh, on a commute i'm laura pagorni i help out around here by let's see one of the things i do is i oversee the coffee team that's one of the things I do and we're looking for new recruits. So if you're interested in helping out with that, just come and see me, let me know. But uh, really glad to see everybody here. I've got some announcements for you. Just want to uh, first welcome any new visitors or anyone visiting online. Uh, really glad that you're choosing to spend your, your day with us, um, your time with us, really appreciate that. Whether you're uh, watching live or later on um, in your car or whatnot, really glad. And if you ever have any questions, any inquiries, send us an email at uh, um, info at ucrossroads.net, and we're happy to uh, get those answers for you. So just want to highlight a few things that are happening around here. We've got Family Against Narcotics. It's a really, really wonderful organization uh, that's helping in the community. Our own Pam Blair is going to be um, hosting this. It's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be right before the regularly scheduled Al-Anon meeting, which is here at 7.30. So Al-Anon and Pam with uh, Family Against Narcotics, they're partnering for this presentation. If you know anybody that's suffering from uh, chemical dependency, alcohol dependency, and needs some help in, with how to, how to get rehab and how to get reestablished in the community, that's what Families Against Narcotics helps with. So highly encourage you to come and just listen to what that program has to offer. Free of charge, just come on by tomorrow at 7. And then you can learn more about that. And I'm not even going to try with my phone because it keeps blanking out. I'm just going to go with this. Here we go. So post high school, 20-somethings, they meet a couple times during the month at our uh, associate pastor Phil's house out in Northville. They're going to meet tomorrow night at 630. It doesn't give details on how to contact him. If you're here in person, his uh, contact phone number is in the bulletin. If you're listening online, again, send us an email at info at ecrossroads.net, right? And we'll get that information to you. That's just a good time for us. Uh, gathering and, and talking about God and getting to know each other. 
And next we have, oh yeah, trunk or treat. That's going to be coming up on Sunday. Sunday, yeah, the 24th, a week from today, after the 11 o'clock worship service. So what that's all about, we're, start, we're going to start with a pizza lunch, and then we're just encouraging all families, mostly people without kids, to be honest, if you could set up your cars with, uh, with treats and you don't have to do a game, you don't have to do something elaborate like it's been done in the past, just passing out candy is great. But that way it'll have, uh, leave space for the families with the kids that they can go and, and go car to car. But any, certainly anybody, we want everyone to, uh, to be included and to participate in this. It's always a good time. And just keep everything uh, non-scary as much as possible, right? But uh, really encourage everyone and invite your friends, invite your neighbors. It's always a good time. Let's pray for good weather for that. And then we just want to make sure that everybody is uh, aware of all the ways they can be connected around here. I'll be at the um, welcome table outside the office after the service. You can come talk to me if you need a more clarification on anything. You can send us that email at <laughs> info at ecrossroads.net. If you're not getting the weekly email, it's coming out uh, typically Tuesday mornings right now. You can fill out the call to faith form that's inside your bulletin, turn it into the uh, offering box or hand it to me at the welcome table. We'll make sure you're connected with that. Certainly our Facebook page, Crossroads Church, and then uh, the website, ecrossroads.net, and certainly the apps you can get on your phone. So right now, I just um, ask you to, uh, we're going to stand, right? And we're going to prepare, prepare our hearts for worship as our worship team leads us in the call to worship. We're going to have the lovely Amy do the call to worship <laughs> with you guys today. So you guys, we'll read the bold words together. Creating God, we gather in your name to worship you. We give thanks that there is a small spark of God within us. Kindle, Kindle that, that small spark, spark into, into a, flame a flame of love and service. service. Sustaining God, we gather in your name to worship you. We celebrate the loving presence of God in our life. May God's, God's loving, loving presence, presence be a strong influence in our life. life. Nurturing God, we gather in your name to worship you. We rejoice that God teaches us about love and forgiveness through the gift of the stories of Scripture. As, As we, we grow, grow in faith, faith trust, trust, and love for God, God may our worship witness and service bring honor to God's holy name. Amen. The weapon may be formed but it won't prosper When the darkness falls it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Oh my God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the
seated. There we go. Hi. Morning. I'm Dave, one of the pastors here. It's the time in our service where we uh, take in our, our offering. There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, if you're online, you can go to our website. You can mail in a check. Uh, people still do that. Uh, there's the app you can give. If you're in the room, there's a little box between the doors back there you can give. And we just uh, appreciate that everybody gives so faithfully. We're going to look at a scripture, and then we're going to you know, say some prayers for needs around in the community. So we've been looking at this. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I love that reminder to think like giving needs to come out of a place of joy and cheerfulness. And a lot of the giving, seems like most of the giving people at Crossroads do, does is that. We just we feel your joy in, in how you give, and uh, hopefully you don't feel pressured <laughs> and manipulated to do that, um, but you're just doing that out of joy. And so uh, there's a, another giving opportunity coming up. Um, Joe's going to do another, Joe and Jeff uh, are going to do another little run, a couple of miles there, <laughs> 50K. Uh, he's doing, you know, he's doing the marathon right now, and he's going to be doing that, like, you guy. You go for it. <laughs> you go for it, and I won't. Um, but thank God he's doing that. This is going to help uh, raise money for three nonprofits for Renewed Hope Counseling, uh, dear to my heart, for Capernaum Healthcare, and for Active Faith in Town. And so, you know, last time, last year, uh, when Joe and Jeff did that, I mean, it, it like raised a lot of money for each of those, and it helps so much. It really does. So um, this is an opportunity to give cheerfully. And um, you go to the website, and you'll see a big button right on there. You can just click, and it'll take you to the page with all the information and how to give. And you can get a shirt, and a T-shirt, or a long sleeve shirt, and all those. So hope that you'll do that. Well, we're going to uh, leave a little time for everyone to pray. Well, we'll I'll pray collectively, but in your hearts, you can lift up a need, but I also want to pray for Lisa Kalkinen. Um, Steve and Lisa were part of Crossroads Church for a long, long time, and we're still, you know, connected to them. Steve's going to be, you know, Lord willing, doing the, the Christmas play. Uh, we're going to be, you know, helping out with that. But Lisa right now, she's in intensive care on a respirator with COVID, and so we, you know, he's been updating on Facebook and so, but we really want to pray. So we'll pray for her and then any other needs that come up. So if you'll pray with me. Father God, we just pray right now for Lisa that your healing hand will be on her, that you'll be with those doctors, give them wisdom, give them 
just insight to know when to do this, when to do that, that they'll have clear minds, that she will feel your peace uh, and know that you're there, that you'll give Steve your peace and McKenna and Justin, Lord, that they will just know uh, you're there and that you're touching them and healing her body. And we just thank you for that. And we lift up other things that are in our mind's heart right now. Um, all the needs, you know what they are. You know our hearts. You know our minds. We, we just present those needs to you and pray and ask that you will meet them. And we thank you and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, kids, you got this Marin in the back if you want to go. The rest of us, let's stand up and we'll keep worshiping. Before we start this morning, I uh, normally when I say Jeff Firestone's name from up here, it's because he has this sweater that, this Christmas sweater that is the most obnoxious thing you've ever seen, <laughs> except for Mike Peavy House has something more obnoxious. And at some point, I'm sure you'll see both of them, but that's not why I'm, I'm saying Jeff Firestone's name today. Jeff has had some health issues recently. I'm happy to see you here.
Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy on us now, for your name is great and your heart is great, Kyrie eleison, over all you reign, you alone can save, Kyrie eleison, Lord Christ have mercy on us now. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy on us now.
pray with me? Father God, we do owe it all to you. Um, so glad that your love ran red, that your forgiveness, your work on the cross made it so we can be in relationship with you. And now as we look at your word, give us spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear. And that uh, all the other cares of the day will just melt away and we'll be able to hear from you. And we thank you and we ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. You can be seated. So we're uh, continuing on our series, Heroes of the Old Testament. And uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Phil, he kind of got us started with Genesis. And he said, you know, the hero there was God. And he said that really all the stories in the Old Testament, really the hero is God, using people who may look like heroes, but they're flawed. They need God. They need help. And then Mark brought us, you know, the following week, last week, he brought us Joseph, who does, did a lot of heroic things, but we also saw he needed God. He needed transformation. And so today we're going to look at some heroes that I don't really know we can even call them heroes, <laughs> but... Um, but we can hopefully learn from them. So to get us started, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a physical exam of some kind? Jeff, you're saying, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had a mental exam of some kind? Have you ever like been kind of worried? Like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen when I have this exam. What will they find out? Or maybe you avoided it for a while. Like, well, maybe if I avoid it, but then if I avoid it, it doesn't go away. And, you know, it's kind of that, that weird back and forth. So you decide to get it, maybe, hopefully. But sometimes, you know, after an exam, it might be like, wow, good thing I went because they told me this, and now I can make a choice, and I can make some changes that are helpful. Like many years ago, uh, when, I, when Linda and I first got married, I was uh, working in a place, and I was becoming a service manager. So I had to get my commercial driver's license, which meant I had to go and get uh, an exam. I hadn't been to the doctor in years. I'm like, I feel good. Don't need the doctor. And when they checked my blood, they're like, oh, your cholesterol is 275. And you got heart disease in your family. My, di my dad died at 42. His brother died in his early 50s, I think. And so, yeah, but I was glad because I made the changes. I got the numbers to come down. They're still down. And so, but man, I'm glad for that exam because sometimes those things can help. And sometimes we just go to, you know, kind of rule out and check things out. So a few weeks ago, you know, and uh, well, first last week, I don't know if you remember Mark's joke. He had the good news, bad news joke. And the, guy, the bad news guy was the golfer, <laughs> right? So I had the bad news joke, good news on me. I went a few weeks ago uh, to get one of those check it out tests, this MRI where they checked my whole brain. And then afterwards, you know, the guy says, good news is we found nothing. Like, whew. So the bad news is we found nothing. <laughs> we checked the whole head, nothing in there. Explained a lot. And then when I was telling Jeff that story, you had a similar situation, didn't you? Like, <laughs> no, with Jeff, they found this huge brain. Then, oh, wow, this guy's like a genius. But uh, <laughs> found nothing. But what about our soul? What if we were to examine our souls? Or maybe I want to avoid that because I don't want to look in there and go, who? Don't like what's in there. But maybe if I do that, it will lead to a good place. It will lead me to make some changes that are helpful. So we want to talk about examining the soul. And there's a scripture in the Old Testament. It goes like this in the book of Lamentations. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return or turn to the Lord. Let us examine our ways and test them and turn to the Lord. And so we're going to use that as we, you know, we look at some characters in the Old Testament. We're going to use that as sort of our, our guide as we go. But before we do that, let me ask you this. Who's your favorite Old Testament hero. Anybody got one? David, Joseph, Methuselah. Yeah, that guy, like, he lived it out, man. He was <laughs> All right, so, but I'm, it's interesting, though, that nobody mentioned her. I thought that would be, like, everybody's first go-to. Of course, the donkey. <laughs> 
We're going to be looking today at the story of Balaam and the donkey. And, you know, what we're going to probably find is the only real hero in the story is the donkey. This is kind of a strange story. And, you know, when, when we were putting together this series, I think, you know, it was my great idea to bring up, well, what about the Balaam and the donkey story? And, of course, Joe's like, yeah, why don't you run with that, Dave? And then um, as I'm doing it, I'm like, what was I thinking? Because this, <laughs> this is a very bizarre story. In fact, one scholar said, the drama, irony, and paradoxes of this story fascinate and perplex the reader. And it can be perplexing. It can be strange. But I was kind of glad, too, because it challenged me and it helped me to dig out some things. And hopefully it'll be helpful to us as well as we go through this. So we're going to use this scripture um, to kind of guide us through. We're going to examine. We're going to test, basically kind of look at the test results and see how these characters can turn to the Lord and look at ourselves and go, can I relate to these characters and examine myself and test and turn to the Lord? So, we wanna, so if you're taking notes, those are kind of your main points. Examine, uh, test, and turn. And so the story is in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. It's a long story, uh, and it's a, it's a little different of a setting. So to kind of help us with the visual, if you think of an old Western movie, and, you know, an old Western movie, often there'd be, you know, the, the wagon train. And the wagon train would have a group of people, maybe a large group, small group, and you're kind of getting involved with the stories of the lives of the wagon train people, right? And then, but every now and then, you know, as the wagon train's going through, like a mountain pass, you know, the camera might cut up to somebody watching up in the rocks. You ever see that? <laughs> Probably most Westerns, you got that. Somebody's watching. And when you think about a lot of the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, four for sure, a lot, of, a lot of the story is Israel is the wagon train. I mean, it's about these people, probably up to maybe 2 million, who came out of Egypt, and they're on their way to the promised land, and they're traveling like the big, huge wagon train. And uh, most of the story is about that. But in this case, in these couple of chapters, the story is actually about people watching them. And one guy named Balak, he's the king of this land called Moab, and then he's going to hire a guy named Balaam, which we'll meet in a few minutes. So kind of keep that in mind. We're not really you know, reading about Israel now. We're, we're reading about people who are watching them and kind of all behind the scenes. Okay, so as we keep that in mind, we start the story in chapter 22. <clears throat> it says, Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people, because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. So he sees all these people. He knows, like, I have no army. If they come at me that's big enough to handle this, what am I going to do? So Balak needs some strategery. Kind of a word, you know, if you remember the old Saturday Night Live word, they came up with strategery. He needs some strategery to deal with this. And so what does he do? It says, Balak sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Amnah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they're dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So his strategy is to hire a professional curser, basically. <laughs> uh, and... You know, curses were very important, so were blessings in the ancient times. And people put a lot of stock in them, and not just anybody could do this. That's why he hired this guy who's this spiritual guy. He seems to be in touch with God or the gods. And he, if he puts a curse on them, then even though they're large, right, something will go wrong, and they won't be able to overtake us, and we'll overtake them because they'll be cursed. So he wants to hire this professional. And, you know, when you think about it, like, 
thank God, you know, we're done with curses and that silly idea, like that a group of people would do something and work really hard, but no matter what they do, something goes wrong and they lose. You know, thank God that that's not going on today anywhere. Whew, done with the curses stuff. Absolutely, done with the curses. So that's Balak's strategery. And so he sends these people, and then um, Balaam, now the, the professional, he wants to go seek and ask God, is it all right to do this? So we pick up the story. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Okay. So it seems like so far, Balaam's a pretty upright guy. He's seeking God. He's doing the right thing. And he tells Balak no. And Balak needs some more strategery. So what does he do? Then Bala, Balak sent other princes, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. So basically, Balak's all sweet in the deal here, right? He just needs a little more money, and for sure he'll come. That's his strategy. I guess that sounds makes sense. So how does Balaam respond? But Balaam answered them. Even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could do, not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now stay here tonight, as the others did, and I will find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Now we've got kind of a huh? I mean, didn't God say don't go? And now he's saying it's okay to go? Okay. Well, all right, let's keep going. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Huh? Didn't God tell him to go? So he goes? Now he's angry that he went. What's going on here? Okay, maybe it gets better, or maybe it gets more bizarre. Let's look. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, neither to the right nor to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was, very, he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you right now. Anything strange about this story yet? <laughs> what do you notice that's strange? Donkey's talking, yeah, maybe Shrek does that, but really, this is a real donkey talking. And that is very strange. But you know what's even stranger to me? That Balaam answers this donkey. <laughs> like, this happens every other day, right? Like, he's, like, if that were you or me, they'd go, whoa, wait, did that donkey, you know, asking the servants, did you just hear that? Did the donkey talk? Am I going crazy here? No, he just answers it like, oh, yeah, my donkey's talking. Then I answer the donkey. Very strange to me. Okay, let's keep going. It gets more bizarre. Then the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden? To this day, have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one. Keep that in mind. Your path is a reckless one before me. 
The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you're displeased, I'll go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Okay. <laughs> Glad you guys know what to do with that. I have no idea. So again, no. No, but what we're seeing here is it looked like Balaam's this pretty upright guy, he's a pretty spiritual guy, but something seems to be going wrong. Why is God angry? You know, uh, maybe, obviously, there's something that God knew in Balaam's heart that we're not seeing, obviously, because he says there's a reckless path. But we'll just keep that in mind because we're just examining right now. So to finish the story up, and it's a long one, so I'm going to just give us the cliff note version, bullet points to get through to the end. So basically, then after that, Balaam tells Balak, I must speak only what God puts in my mouth can't curse him. Balak ignores that and offers Balaam a steak dinner. Balaam tells Balak he can't curse what God has not cursed. Then Balaam said to him, come with me to another place where you can see them. You'll only see a part, but not all of them, and from there curse them for me. Yeah, maybe if you don't see the whole group, just a little bit of them, maybe then it'll be okay to curse them. Strategery. Balaam, again, reports, God has blessed Israel, and I can't change it. Okay, so probably by now, Balak's got it, right? He finally gets the, no, it's just not going to happen. Then Balak says to Balaam, come, let us take, let me take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God to let you curse them for me from there. And Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, overlooking the wasteland. He's kind of like, you know, the, a, real, a real estate person, love them. But, you know, sometimes if you're going in the kitchen, like, I don't know, this kitchen's kind of ugly. Let me show you the master suite. It's really awesome, you know? And you're like, yeah, but the closet's small. Oh, let's go outside. You should see the backyard. Because maybe if you see this view, maybe you'll change your mind and buy the house, right? And so that's what Balak's trying to do. Maybe if I just do whatever, something will change. Isn't that the definition of, definition of crazy? You know, <laughs> keep doing the same thing or expecting different results doesn't happen. So we finish up here. Balaam basically blesses Israel instead of cursing them. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam. He struck his hands together and said to him, I summon you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them these three times. Now leave at once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. So he ends up, Balaam doesn't get his reward. Wow, there's a lot going on here as we examine the behavior of these characters. So now we want to test. Now we want to say, what do we find as we examine these characters? What do we find in Balak? And maybe, you know, we could say, can I relate to Balak? I mean, he's kind of a knucklehead. I can't relate to Balak. I mean, who acts like that? He's just too much of a goofball. First off, he makes an assumption. He makes an assumption. He sees this large group of people, and he just assumes they're going to attack him. They weren't telling them he's going to attack them. He just assumed it in his mind, and then he ran with it. He took all his energy and his resources and time and money, and he just went to deal with this assumption that was in his head. And, you know, it didn't matter that he didn't challenge it. What if he's wrong and didn't care? He just went ahead and did that on his assumption. Aren't you glad we never do goofy stuff like that? I never have an assumption in my mind, and I just roll with it, regardless of what it's going to do in, my, in a relationship, whatever, what, regardless of what it's going to do to other people or to my own life. I just go as if the assumption's true and never challenge it. Glad I never do that like Balak. And if Balak would have challenged that, what we know now, because we have the big picture, Moses talks about this situation in Deuteronomy, in hindsight, and he says, And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession. 
So Israel never had any plans on attacking Moab. Balak did all that for nothing because he had an assumption and he just ran with it. And sometimes I have to examine myself and go, do I do that? Yeah, sometimes I do that, <laughs> right? Not helpful. And then Balak can't take no for an answer. I mean, who's the stubborn donkey in this story? And, you know, he's, he's got all this anxiety and this thing, this problem feels bigger than what he can handle. It's out of his control, but he tries to take control anyway, and he won't take no for an answer, and he just keeps doing, you know, maybe if I go here, maybe I try this angle, maybe I do that, and God keeps saying, no, no, I don't want to hear no. I'm going to do it my way because this feels crazy and i got to take control. Aren't you glad we don't do that like Balak? Like in a pandemic? Like where there's this thing with vaccines and there's mass and there's political upheaval and there's conspiracies and there's all this stuff going on and it feels like the world's out of control and I'm going to somehow take control of something I don't have control over and maybe God's saying, no, don't do what you're doing. I don't want to hear no because this feels too crazy and I got to do this. I can't take no for an answer. Glad we're not like Balak. I'm going to do that. The problem is I am often like Balak, and I try to take control of something I have no control over. What about Balaam? I mean, he seems like a pretty upright guy, but yet maybe not. There's something else going on. One scholar says, up to this point, Balaam has been portrayed as a man of great spiritual stature who can meet with God when he wants and whose words have tremendous effects on the fate of nations. Here, his spiritual blindness and powerlessness is disclosed, this donkey incident. He cannot see the angel of the Lord standing in his path, though his donkey can. The whole reason this story is put like that is to show us that Balaam was blinded, spiritually blind. He wasn't examining himself. He wasn't looking. He was resting on his spiritual pedigree. He's saying, you know, I've got God on my side. I'm, people come to me. Right? I've got this. I don't need to examine myself. I'm all right. But what would have happened if he would have? What motive would have been in there? Because God was very angry for a reason, not because he just gets angry on a whim. He knew something about Balaam's heart. He knew his motive. And we can actually get a picture of his motive because we get some information from Peter in the New Testament. And Peter's talking, writing to a group and he's telling them about these people who are on a wrong path. And in, in his writing, he says, for talking about these people, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So now we got some insight to his transgression. He, was, he had some greed, some motive going, thinking, hey, this will look good on the surface, but I'm going to work the system. I'm going to somehow maybe do the curse, whatever. And God was telling him, I want you to only go and say what I tell you, because he knew something about Balaam's heart and motive, and Balaam wasn't checking it out. He wasn't doing self-examination. He needed a donkey to show him something spiritually. Aren't you glad you're not like Balaam? Although I am. In fact, I remember my, my donkey story. Uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, and, and I grew up my first few years, I was in Catholic school, and I really don't remember much that I learned much. But one thing I remember was, you know, there's another name for a donkey. Anybody know it? I'm afraid to say it, we're in church. <laughs> An ass or a jackass right? And some translations of the Bible have that. And somehow, in my little mind, I picked that information up, okay? <laughs> and so I'm outside with my sister one day, and we're, you know, doing what we usually do, arguing, doing something. We're by the kitchen window, which is open, and I call my sister a jackass. And my dad goes, David! I hear him running out to the door. But I'm thinking, this time, I've got justification. <laughs> this time, I'm in the right. And I said, Dad, that word is in the Bible. And that didn't 
change him in any way for some weird reason. That didn't stop him, right? Because he, <laughs> what he's basically saying is that's not how you talk to your sister. That's not what you do. When you have the truth, and you might say like Balaam, you're like, oh, I'm a spiritual person. I have the truth. And that means I can use this truth in any way I want. And I can talk to people any way I want. And I can, you know, disrespect people any way I want because I've got the truth on my side. No, that's not the heart. The heart of God says, no, we need to examine ourselves if we're doing that. If I'm treating people that way, to examine myself because he tells us to love people, to love everybody, even my enemy. So I need to examine myself. So now we look to turn. We've looked at their behavior. We've tried to see ourselves in them. And now what do we do? What does Balak need to do? Well, one of the things Balak needs that I think I need when I want to take control of something that I have no control over is maybe listen to a proverb. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. I need to do that when I want to take control and be like Balak and do that. I also need humility when I'm in that state. Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. All my anxiety, all the stuff that's going on in my life that feels bigger than what I can do that gives me that anxiety, he's saying, cast that on me. I'm bigger than that. On the mighty hand of God. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And a little later on in that passage, he says, can anyone of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No. So God is bigger, and when I feel like the problem's bigger and I need to still somehow solve a problem I can't deal with, I need to trust God. If I'm acting like Balak, I need to humble myself and then realize that God is in control, and I'm not. He's God, and I'm not. Well, what about Balaam? What does he need? Right? He rests on his spiritual pedigree. He rests on the fact that, well, you know, I'm the spiritual person. I don't need to examine myself. What would Jesus say to Balaam? Because, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, there was a lot of Balaams. <laughs> there was a lot of religious people walking around who said, you know, I've got it all together. I don't need to examine myself. I tell other people how bad they are because I'm together. And Jesus was encountering them a lot. And he would say things to them like, you guys that are doing that, you're like a grave that's full of dead man's bones. But on the outside, there's like this nice whitewashed stone. And they can't see the dead man's bones inside. Or he would say to things to them like, you're blind guides. <laughs> you're blind people trying to lead the blind. You're missing it. Like Balaam, you're not seeing the angel. You're not seeing what's really going on because you won't examine yourself and you won't let God change you. So maybe he would tell them the same thing he told those religious people. Like in Luke, it says to those who are confident in their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, that's the religious leader, and the other, a tax collector. He had the lowest of the low. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. Don't you love that? <laughs> God, <clears throat> I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Wow. When we think about that, you know, we don't examine ourselves to say, oh, look at what a horrible person I am. 
and I'll just beat myself up, and God's just always angry with me. Because that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, no, the opposite happens. If you don't examine yourself, if you don't open up and say, look, I got these things that are wrong with me. I need help. I'm a sinner. If I'm just looking down at other people and thinking I'm better than them, then I'm not going to get help. Jesus said, I came to give you life more abundantly. That's not an abundant life. And, And he also said that the thief, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And when I'm doing that, when I'm acting like Balaam, and I'm thinking I'm better than people, I'm getting things, I'm getting good life taken from me. I'm letting the thief take that. I need to say, yeah, maybe I don't do all the things some other people do, but I need God just like them. I'm them. I'm Balak. I'm Balaam. I need God. We sang that song, Kyrie Eleison, right? Lord, have mercy. That's a beautiful song. Lord, have mercy, because that's what I need. And I need to do that all the time, on a regular basis. There's a place where Balaam actually does, and you read the story, he does actually have some spiritual insight. And he realizes what he's been doing wrong. But then something must have changed, because when you read about him in other parts of the the Bible, you see, like, yeah, he didn't go a good way. So he wasn't practicing it. He had a moment, but then he didn't keep it up. And he went back to his old way. So it's really important that we make a regular practice of self-examination, you know, which includes a God examination. Search my soul, like the Psalms say, Lord, search me and know me. Why? Not to, right? Not because we want to beat ourselves up and look at our shame, but because we want to be delivered from that. We want to be changed and healed and live the life Jesus tells us we can have. So as our call to faith today. Will we examine and test and turn to the Lord? And there's practical ways we can do that. Um, I put in your, in your bulletin, if you got one, there's a little insert, and it's John Wesley's 22 questions. John Wesley, back in the 1700s, he started this little group um, when he was in college at Oxford, and him and some other men, and they, would, they, would, they came up with these questions, and they would ask themselves this every day. And eventually, you know, John Wesley really started the Methodist church, though he never became a Methodist. <laughs> but, um, but that became something that, you know, went down, and it's just one tool. There's lots of other ones. You know, the Catholic Church has examination of conscience. You know, there's lots of tools, but something like this is maybe a helpful thing. And you can, you know, if you even look at Question 19, we just talked about that, says, Do I thank God that I'm not as other people, especially as the Pharisee who despised the publican or the tax collector, right? Am I looking at other people and going, yeah, boy, they're really bad and I'm good. I mean, so some of these are very just practical things. Again, not meant to condemn us, but meant to say, God, is there a place I'm missing it? And I can turn to you because that's what he wants. So now as we prepare our hearts for communion, and if you're in the room and you need, uh, you need communion, Jeff will, uh, <laughs> I think that's what you're going to do, right, Jeff? <laughs> Hopefully he's not going to the bathroom. But Jeff will, um, you know, just raise your hand. Jeff will bring over to you uh, the elements, which we'll all take together in a minute. But, you know, the... Um, This is a great time. Communion is really about self-examination. You know, Paul the Apostle talks about doing that. Examine yourself, you know, to make sure you're partaking of the body and the bread worthily. Right? We want to be able to examine ourselves. And and if you're here or you're if you're online and you're getting ready, there's one over here, Jeff. Karen had her hand up. Yeah, if you're watching a line or you're saying, you know, I'm just, I'm not ready to do that, that's fine. We don't want you to force you to do anything you're not ready to do. Um, But if you are wanting to partake, this is a great time we can reflect. It's a great time we can just ask God to look and say, I can examine myself. God can look at my soul. And if there's anything anywhere where I'm getting off track, where I'm Balak, where I'm Balaam, then... God longs for us to bring that to him because he wants to change that. He wants us, wants to transform us. 
So what I'll do is I will say a prayer, and in that prayer I'll give us a, you know, a few seconds, not even a full minute, but we will have time of silence to just um, let God and the Holy Spirit do His work in us. So will you pray with me? Father God, just thank you so much that uh, we have this opportunity to have this meal, this meal that you provided, this meal that represents how you want to cleanse us and change us and make us better and give us that full life. So I pray, Lord, as we prepare our hearts for this meal, that anything you will bring up in our, in our eyes, in our soul, um, anything where we're acting in a way that's not helpful, not good, not good for our relationship, not good for our life, not in connection with your will. Bring that up so that we can turn it over to you. And we'll pray that right now in, in the silence. Lord, we thank you again for your forgiveness, your cleansing. We pray your blessing on the bread and on the juice that will fill us up and keep us going. And we'll think about you. We'll think about this as we go along our way about what you've done for us. We thank you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So as we uh, think about that night when Jesus was at the Last Supper, he took a piece of bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat all of it. Let's eat together. And then he took a cup. He said, this is the cup of my blood shed for you. Drink all of it. Let's drink together. And can we pray one more time? Father God, as we go from here today, that you'll help us to keep a rhythm of self-examination, that rhythm of examining, testing, and turning to you so that we could just experience that full life that you've given us, that you want us to live. And help us to do that. Whatever is going to be a helpful reminder, bring that into our minds as we go through our week and months and years. We ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. All right, well, let's stand up and we'll go out worshiping.
all for coming today. It was good to see you. Be somebody's light as you go through this week. You never know who's going to need it.